Welcome back to this video series on algorithms and algorithm analysis. In this supplemental, we'll cover general processes for how to analyze recursive algorithms. Recall that recursive algorithms are functions that simply make one or more recursive calls to itself with a different input value. When analyzing such algorithms, the first three steps are virtually the same. You still need to identify the input, the input size, and the elementary operation. However, when you go to analyze how many times the elementary operation is executed with respect to the input size in step 4, you generally don't set up a summation. Instead, you set up a recurrence relation. To get an asymptotic characterization of that recurrence relation, you need to solve the recurrence to get a closed form solution. To illustrate this idea, consider the classic example of computing the Fibonacci sequence. The nth Fibonacci number can be computed recursively using the following pseudocode. In general, the nth Fibonacci number is the sum of the two previous numbers in the sequence. The sequence starts with values 1 and 1, giving us the base cases here. Let's analyze this algorithm. Skipping to step 3, we can identify the addition as the elementary operation. Note that the two subtractions are not generally counted as they are necessary to the control structure of the algorithm. In step 4, we need to determine how many additions are performed by this algorithm. It is easy to see that we perform one addition on line 4 if n is strictly greater than 1. However, we make two recursive calls to this function, which also perform a number of additions. To capture this idea, we need to define a resource function. Let a sub n be the number of additions performed by the Fibonacci function on an input of n. We can easily identify the base conditions. For inputs 0 and 1, no additions are performed, and so a sub 0 and a sub 1 are both 0. But what about in general? Here's the code again. Again, we make one addition on line 4. We then make a call to the Fibonacci function on an input of n minus 1. So how many additions does this make? We've already defined a sub n to be the number of additions performed by Fibonacci on an input of n, so the number of additions performed by Fibonacci on an input of n minus 1 is simply a sub n minus 1. Likewise, the second call makes a sub n minus 2 additions. We've rearranged the terms here, but this is the recurrence relation. It's an equation that's defined in terms of itself, much like the Fibonacci sequence itself. This particular type of recurrence relation is a non-homogeneous recurrence relation of degree 2. There are lots of general solution techniques to solve this recurrence relation to get a closed form solution. A closed form solution is an equivalent equation, but is not defined in terms of previous values. For example, a closed form solution to a sub n looks like this. Here phi is the golden ratio. However, covering solution techniques for how to do this are beyond the scope of this series. Instead, we'll use a tool called the Master Theorem. Recall that the end goal of algorithm analysis is to derive an asymptotic characterization for the efficiency of an algorithm. For some common, for some common recurrence relations that arise from algorithm analysis, we don't necessarily need to solve them in order to characterize them. Instead, we can skip solving them and immediately come to a conclusion using a tool called the Master Theorem. Here's the formal statement of the Master Theorem. If we have a recurrence relation t sub n that satisfies the following form, that is t sub n is equal to a times t sub n divided by b plus some function f of n, then we can apply the following theorem. If we can bound f of n by some polynomial, say theta n to the d, then based on the values a, b, and d, we can conclude that t sub n has one of the three following asymptotic characterizations. Intuitively, if a is strictly less than b to the d, then we are making fewer recursive calls than we are doing non-recursive work, as characterized by the function f of n. If a equals b to the d, then we're roughly doing the same amount of recursive work as non-recursive work. Finally, if a is greater than b to the d, then we're doing more recursion than non-recursive work. In each of these three cases, we can bound t sub n by some polynomial or polylog function accordingly. The master theorem is a bit of a misnomer, as it cannot be applied generally to any recurrence relation. It can only be applied if your recurrence relation is of this particular form. That is, you make a constant number of recursive calls, and the input is decreased by a constant amount each time, 
and some non-recursive work is performed. Further, that non-recursive work must be bounded by some polynomial. However, if your recurrence relation from an algorithm analysis does conform to these conditions, it is a simple matter to identify A, B, and D, and simply plug and chug. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. The first example is a recursive version of binary search. If you're unfamiliar with this algorithm or don't remember the details, please see another video in the collection or the provided textbook. Our immediate concern will be to analyze this algorithm and apply the master theorem. As a first step, we identify the input size n, the size of the array or collection that we're searching. The elementary operation is the comparison on line 4. According to the pseudocode, however, you may notice that we could argue that there are actually two comparisons, one on line 4 and one on line 6. To simplify the analysis, however, we'll consider these two comparisons as one. This is also more accurate in practice as well. Typically, a comparison is done with a comparator or comparator function, so only one method or function call is used to actually compare. The value, positive, negative, or zero, would then be used to guide the control flow of the algorithm. As with the Fibonacci example, we need to set up a resource function. Let C sub n be the number of comparisons made by binary search on an input collection or array of size n. In the base case, the array is empty. We don't make any comparisons. Otherwise, we have a non-recursive cost of one comparison on line 4. However, we also make recursive calls on lines 7 and 9. However, at most one of these calls is made. Further, the input size of the recursive call is roughly half, since binary search cuts the array in half each call. Rearranging the terms gives us a recurrence relation that characterizes the number of comparisons made by binary search. This particular recurrence relation is in the required form and we can apply the master theorem. A, the number of recursive calls, is 1. B is 2, since we cut the array in half each time. And D is 0, because a constant function is bounded by a polynomial of degree 0. The relation is that A is equal to B to the D. So by case 2 of the master theorem, binary search makes a logarithmic number of comparisons. Let's run through another example, merge sort. Merge sort works by breaking an array up into two equal parts and recursing until the array is of a size 0 or 1, which is sorted by definition. As the recursion returns, two sorted sublists are merged together. As before, the input size is n, and the elementary operation is comparisons performed in the merge subroutine. We set up a resource function c sub n to represent the number of comparisons made by merge sort on an input size of n. We won't go into the details, but the non-recursive merge subroutine performs about n-1 comparisons in the worst case. Finally, we make two recursive calls, each on an input about half as big. Here's the recurrence relation rearranged, and once again we have it in the form that allows us to apply the master theorem. The number of recursive calls in this case is 2. B is also 2, because of the same halving of the array on each call. And d in this case is 1, since n minus 1 is a linear function. As before, case 2 applies, since a is equal to b to the d. In conclusion, merge sort is an efficient n log n sorting algorithm. Both examples resulted in us using the case 2 of the master theorem. But the other cases do come up. For example, Strassen's fast matrix multiplication algorithm makes 7 recursive calls on inputs about half the size, with no non-recursive work. Another example of case 3 coming into play is a recursive full binary tree traversal. The first case is not as common, but it can happen. 